Thursday from the NFL scouting combine, lots of news and rumors, defensive linemen getting measured up, hitting the field in drills and workouts, the highlights there, uh, some strife within the Baltimore Ravens organization, and we've got a franchise tag being utilized, maybe another one coming as well on today's Peacock and Williamson. NFL analyst Brian Peacock and former NFL scout Matt Williamson bring you expert NFL analysis every day in less than 30 minutes. Get an inside look into the NFL on the field and in the front office. With elite breakdowns, next level analysis, and in-depth information only for the real NFL fans. This is Peacock and Williamson, and it starts now. Welcome to the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock alongside Matt Williamson at BD Peacock at Williamson NFL. Thanks everybody for making us your first listen on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Matt, of course, in Indianapolis at the NFL Scouting Combine. So we'll get his uh, insight into what's happening there, what the buzz is around Indy with the prospects, especially the defensive linemen that were finally hitting the field, finally seeing some prospects and some 40 times and some arm lengths out there in Indianapolis. But Matt, I first want to start with some of the other news happening within some organizations and some uh, work being done, uh, not only with the NFL draft, but with some free agents and some franchise tags and um, maybe some problems, even more problems than we thought brewing with the Baltimore Ravens. And this is a really interesting one, Matt. Um, there was a quote from Eric DaCosta, the Baltimore Ravens GM, and he was asked why the why the Baltimore Ravens have had problems uh, building a wide receiver group and drafting wide receivers. And DeCosta's answer was, quote, if I had an answer, that would probably mean I have some better receivers. We're going <laughs> to keep swinging. And one of those wide receivers, Rashad Bateman, who was drafted in the first round not long ago, injured last year, took offense to that. And his response on Twitter publicly was, quote, how about you play to your player's strength and stop pointing your finger at us and number eight? Blame the one you let do this. We take heat 24-7 and keep us healthy. Care about us and see what happened. Ain't no promises, though. Tired of y'all lying and capping on players for no reason. So um, it's not just maybe contract negotiations with number eight uh, that, that that Rashad Bateman talks about here. Uh, there's a lot of else going on. And and look, I, I, I think the big problem with Eric DaCosta here isn't so much in the team-building strategy. It's that he kind of threw his wide receivers on the bus and was like, yeah, you guys are right. We can't draft wide receivers for crap. Our, our wide receivers aren't good. Uh, if he should have said something like, I think we're doing a pretty good job and I think we've got some good wide receivers. And when we see guys like Rashad Bateman healthy, you're going to see how good our wide receivers are. But that's not really what he said. So that's probably what set Bateman off more than anything else. Yeah, I think there's a lot to unpeel here is I'm more on the Bateman side. I mean, I'm with you with the Costa. It's like blame yourself or be the team guy and say, Oh, we're we're pretty excited about this group of receivers that we see a lot of development. Guys like Rashad were, were unfortunately injured next year. He should come back, you know, huge. They've actually drafted quite a few receivers lately, although they had 11 premium picks last year, 10 of which were in the top four rounds. Zero receivers picked in that group. So part of it is absolutely your own fault. And one of the best ones, the first rounder in 2019, you traded away. Um, and the Bateman injury doesn't help, but I also think scheme has a lot to do with it. I also think that if I'm a free agent wide receiver, that's probably my last place I want to go in terms of catching 100 balls or improving my, you know, outlook on you know, making more money down the road. So I, I respect Bateman for coming out and saying, "Hey, you know, we're all in this together. You know, do a better job on your end too." You know, and I have to think that frustration in that building players everybody involved is boiling over at this point and understandably so it's really what it seems like and yeah. Mike davis former running back for the the ravens responded to bateman and basically said yep this is how it's been so um hmm. yeah the, it seems kind like of siding thing. with bateman you think siding with bateman yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so i don't know how differently things are inside the organization from the outside it would seem to be a model organization with the way they build things the way they keep winning uh, I don't know. Maybe a lot has changed since Ozzy Newsom went on. I thought it was more of a more of the same going on there in, in you know inside the building, but maybe that's not been the case. Yeah, and I do think their style of play is going to always frustrate wide receivers, and I think it's going to change though. They hired a new offensive coordinator. Who knows what the quarterback situation is? 
Maybe the first round picks a wide out. Maybe they trade for DeAndre Hopkins. Who knows? But something needs to be done. You can't just not throw to wide receivers and try to win in this league. Evan Ingram getting the franchise tag, which I think is one of the ones we thought was one of the easier tags, right, Matt? Mm -hmm. We looked at the franchise tag numbers and looked at what uh, teams needed, and we looked at the Jaguars and Evan Ingram and how he played last year. We thought that was a, a, a pretty – a pretty logical tag to happen, but you're hearing some more about the, the New York Giants tags situation as well with potentially Barkley and or, well, you can't tag them both, but uh, either mm -hmm. Barkley or Daniel Jones. Yeah, and real quick on Ingram, one year ago, they signed him to a one-year $10 million deal after a not-so-great run with the Giants on his rookie contract after being a first-round pick, and he was really good for the Jags. Very helpful to Lawrence, mismatch guy. They got him you know, in space. And really, he's only getting a $1 million, give or take, bump for franchising him. And his stock rose way more than that. So that's an easy one. Good for them. Um, the buzz around here is they're really close to signing Barkley, the, the Giants, really far from signing Daniel Jones. Because he's holding out for this $35, $40 million type of deal, which I get where he's coming from. But I side with the Giants on that one. Yeah, so, well, I talked, Matt, yeah. uh, behind the scenes, a lot of people probably don't know about this. I talked with the with David Locke, the, the founder of the Locked On Podcast Network. Mm -hmm. I also asked for $40 million, so I'm waiting to hear back on that. Yeah, I did as well. I was going to hold out for 38 but we haven't gotten a response. They might franchise you and then come back to me. But I, I think that's what the Giants are up to, though. Is The buzz is get a deal done with Saquon, who would be easier to franchise, because like the tight end tag, it's only about $10 million, and then tag Jones. It's not ideal, but at least it buys you a year with Jones. He can prove himself or not. It's, you know, you kind of thought I mean, one of these two scenarios would go come out. I don't even like tagging Jones. I, I would yeah. let him, I'd let him go out there and, and see what he finds on the free agent market. Um, but and we'll talk to others in the meantime. Right. But, it, it, you know, somebody signs him and it's like, okay, cool. Two first round picks. That's fine too. Uh, Cause that, yeah, that's yeah. not going to happen. You know what I mean? But he might find some, um, if you let him talk to other teams, I think you'd find numbers that were similar to what the Giants are probably offering. And who knows, maybe less, because I just don't think there's value out there for Daniel Jones any more than I, I think he's more valuable to the Giants than anybody else. I, I um, but, think so. but franchising him and playing one year under that number is still better than a 40 plus million dollar per year long term contract. I just I don't know how you could possibly do that if you're the Giants. Yeah, I mean, like two years, 75 million, a big chunk of it guaranteed or play under the franchise this year tag is much better it at least oh, yeah. buys you time you might draft one in the third round who looks like a star you know looks like he's an up-and-coming player who knows you know just gives you a lot more options in time and we we saw it with we, we saw it with Kirk Cousins and Kirk Cousins had a better track record for longer than Daniel Jones did but it could help out the player too because if he balls out and has another really good year and even improves on it and now your your standing is even stronger and and so mm -hmm. then you might be able to do something long term. But for a lot of teams, it's starting to look like with how crazy some of the quarterback numbers are getting. I think we're going to see more and more quarterbacks getting the franchise tag because the franchise tag number hasn't caught up to what the top quarterback contracts have been. Good point. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, a little bit of Aaron Rodgers Jets news, too, I've been hearing is it sounds as though. And again, I mean, this is second, third hand information. The Jets priorities are Rodgers one car two. Jimmy three, but you're kind of playing a tightrope game there because Carr could just sign with anybody. And, you know, I mean, and Rogers is dragging his feet and enjoying the process and all that. So that's a real balancing act. And I also heard that Carolina is now involved with Rogers, you know, that they'll give him anything he wants. I mean, knowing that organization. That's an interesting one. And, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't click on the hour and a half long and, you know, maybe some, some of our listeners can clue us in, but um, I, I heard some snippets and, and I got some uh, information about the, the podcast that Aaron Rodgers went on after he came out oh. of his darkness retreat. And it sounded, you know, it was kind of teased as if it was going to be, he was going to let people know about what he was thinking and he didn't really reveal anything. So he's, he says the answer is inside him basically, but th that answer has not come out yet. And he said he spent two of his four days thinking about what it'd be like if he retired and spent a couple of his days in the dark hole thinking about, it would say hole. It was, it's pretty fancy looking. Right. Uh, it wasn't more like a, of a, a, a semi dark. There was like a candle lit yoga retreat room more so than a than With a, a queen size bed and yeah, right. it wasn't like a <laughs> um 
But I'm not sure he found any answers in that dark hole, though. I, he says the answer is within him. I, I think the answer was always within him, though, whether he was in a dark room or not. <laughs> I mean, so we'll find out. And um, but yeah, that there's some business in the NFL that's that's waiting on that. And so some teams might say, you know what? I don't want to wait for Aaron Rodgers anymore. I got to do something like the the Panthers or the New York Jets. And you know, because mm -hmm. very quickly you could go from your first option to your third option if Carr signs somewhere. If you're the New York Jets, and then Rodgers decides he's going to retire then all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, first two options are already out the door and free agency hasn't even gotten here. Yeah, I got to be honest. If, if I'm the Jets, I don't know how patient I am with the Rogers situation or, you know, I mean, it, Carr could get, I just feel like Carr could get snagged by the Saints, the Panthers, the, you know, so many teams any second now, you know what I mean? Like, and I don't want to be held in the hold, stop, you know, stuck, stuck there holding the bag and have to give the the, the Packers whatever they want for Rodgers, who might go to dark hole next year and retire. Jalen Carter, he's been the biggest yeah. story so far of the 2023 scouting combine. He was back in Indy after a one-day absence, so we'll talk about that. Some of the testers. Yeah, and some the, of the his fellow DTs getting out yeah. there. Yeah, fellow right. Defensive linemen and are out there and getting their workouts in and getting tested and stretched out and uh, measured up at the NFL Combine next. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, midway point of the NBA season, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. I love the website, uh, the app too. I mean, you can build your own parlays, and it's so easy and fun and uh, super easy to navigate. One of the easier sites I've seen to navigate through uh, betting platforms. And once you download the Sportsbook app, you can bet on everything from money line to point scores to three-pointers drained in an NBA game or college basketball. Or, of course, you can still bet on NFL football as well. Draft props. And there's going to be a ton more draft props popping up at FanDuel before the NFL draft. I'm sure after the combine, those, those things will start to heat up. And... Super Bowl champion next year, you can bet on it. And how about next year's NFL MVP? So you can still bet on the NFL, even though the NFL season is over or any sport. They got snooker. I don't even know what snooker is. You can snooker. bet on that as well. It's some sort of a billiards game. I know that. Yeah, um, it's English. Plus, uh, FanDuel, are, are you a snooker guy, Matt? No, I think it's English. And I, it may not even have pockets. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm making that up, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's played on a pool table? I think so. I think there's a Q and balls on okay, felt. Yeah. Q and balls. Okay, that's a that's very important. Um, <laughs> and will even lets Take you that combine you your bets for a chance to win a bigger payout with same game parlays. So don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Statement. We've got an official statement now here from Jalen Carter uh, about the the story, and he's uh, he's basically saying that things aren't exactly as they were reported with the incident that happened on January fifteenth in Athens, Georgia. Uh, from Jalen Carter, his official statement: "Quote: This morning, I received a telephone call from the Athens, Georgia Police Department, informing me that two misdemeanor warrants have been issued against me." For reckless driving and racing, numerous, numerous media reports also have circulated this morning containing inaccurate information concerning the tragic events of January 15, 2023. It is my intention to return to Athens to answer the misdemeanor charges against, uh, uh, against me and to make certain that the complete and accurate truth is presented. There is no question in my mind that when all of the facts are known, that I will be fully exonerated of any criminal wrongdoing. So that is the statement from okay. Jalen Carter. And uh, he was back at the combine. Was he today, Matt? Yeah. They said he spent a little bit of jail time, was released not long after came right back here, um, did his best to meet with teams and had this statement that obviously I'm sure was helped by his people, a lawyer, all that. And I'm not accusing of anything. That's what everybody should do. Of course, he did not work out with the defensive tackles. But my first impression was, I guess that's a good sign for Jalen Carter. He's getting in front of it. He's not avoiding the situation. He was able to come back here within, I think, less than 24 hours. 
So he's not just running away from it or, you know, staying locked up. I mean, it would have been worse for his case, obviously, you know? Right. And and there was um, some talk about whether or not teams knew of this beforehand or not, because he had met, he had met with a bunch of teams mm-hmm. right before that. Oh, sure. The combine. And so did they know about it? And so were these conversations had already, or these teams now have to come back and have some conversations with him? Uh, did he let them know? Did he know a little bit more about this? And did he tell the teams beforehand? Cause some teams might not like it if this was ha- out there and he knew it was coming and he didn't mention it to the teams and, and get in front of it. So right. that's, you know, that's something else to think about. So there's still a lot going on here and, and, you know, we don't have all the details, uh, but back at the combine and, and trying to get in front of this thing now and try to, um, you know, put teams at ease and, and, you know, put the, and we'll, I don't know what, there was really nothing I saw that was reported that, that made it sound like that anything was inaccurate, but um, we'll see. We'll see what yeah, happens yeah. with, with Jay. did he, did he get, did he get measured up at least? Cause I'm sure he's not working out. Right. Uh, I assume he got measured. I, he, I know he's not working out. He did none of the drills. I don't even know if he was planning on doing those or not. I'm sitting here looking at the, the combine results. We're recording this as the edge guys are running and doing their stuff. And he's nowhere to be found in terms of, the results, but I don't know if he got measured, but, oh no, he did. He, he was actually a little taller and heavier than I expected. A bigger guy than I even expected. So, oh, wow. Yeah. I think he was 320 ish and I don't have that in front of me. I will find it, but it is, I remember talking about his measurements. They were better than I even thought. I mean, the guy's a phenomenal prospect. There's some uh, very interesting, um, well, there's some very interesting measurements at the combine. On, on Thursday, especially with those defensive mm-hmm. tackles. Yeah, and maybe we should do the third segment just on some of these D-tackle results because they're official, and 40 times and stuff changed for some of these other dudes, but there's three or four guys I'd like to highlight from the D-tackle group, um, namely Kalijah Kali- Kansi from, you know, Hail to Pit, go Panthers. Um, but some of these edge guys are lighting it up too, but I hesitate to talk about them on this podcast because – they're not official. I was watching them live, and you know those things change. But as usual, the overriding theme, and I say this going into every combine, these defensive front specimens, velociraptors, whatever you want to call them, just get more impressive every year by leaps and bounds athletically. Uh, it's looking like – nope, I take it back. I, okay. I thought I found some uh, official measurements for – for Carter. For Carter. Nope. It's still the listed 63310. So they, okay. they were not official. They everybody else was official, but his said 63210. So we'll we'll find that if it is um yeah. if it is out and, there. and it'll be common knowledge soon. But watching yeah. him on tape, I thought he was like a six three three hundred type of guy, and he's noticeably heavier than that. By he's, the way, did you see any, moves. did you see any of his old clips of him playing on offense? Like uh, in no. high school, he played like this. Uh, by the way, there's like video of him. I don't know. I've, I found some video of just like non defensive tackle stuff from him. Just okay. showing, showing how good of an athlete he is. Shows him on the basketball court, windmill dunks at 300 oh, pounds. Uh, he was playing, he played both ways in high school. He was playing like this H back position. And oh my gosh, they were running behind him. He was eliminating people. <laughs> As a, as a lead blocker, it was phenomenal watching him do that. And it's like, man, put him in the backfield, especially one of these rugby scrums. If they don't outlaw that, put him in yeah, the yeah. Uh, for whatever team you draft him on in those jumbo goal line packages. It's pretty, I mean, just, just to show you what kind of an athlete he was, especially, you know, on the basketball court, when you get a guy that's a, a, an NFL sized lineman that's throwing down windmill dunks, I mean, these guys are ridiculous. Well over 300 pounds, and he's right. not. He's not 6'10", 300 pounds, like Carl Malone or whatever. I mean, he's 6'3", right, yeah. you know, right. Crazy. I mean, th- that's 100 pounds more than I weighed when I was 6'4 and able to dunk. And I wasn't throwing down windmills or anything fancy. I was just like, <laughs> all guy with kind of long arms, and I could get up there and throw it down. But it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't dunk contest stuff, that's for sure. And, and, and he could do that kind of stuff. Lighter. I will say, watching high school tape for basically four years, some of these guys you know are superstars. Yeah, they're great at one position, but their coach will be like, sure, you can play offense or go ahead, play some safety or whatever. And it's a joy to watch. Like Larry Fitzgerald, when he spent that year at Valley Forge Military Academy, he played a little linebacker for fun, played a little bit of safety. You know, like you see that a lot in high school and you dig up those old clips. and It's pretty impressive.
let's get to uh, the standouts uh, at the defensive yeah, line yeah. next here. Uh, let's talk Kalaja Kansi and uh, a, t- a ton of other defensive linemen at the combine. Do we have the next Aaron Donald, Matt? Let's get to that next. Uh, first, I do want to thank everybody for making Peacock and Williamson your first listen every single day here on the Locked On Podcast Network. And make sure you check out everything else the network has to offer the new Locked On NFL Draft. And, of course, your team is covered no matter the sport on the Locked On Podcast Network. So, Matt, what's the buzz around Kalaja Kansi? Uh, Pitt, I mean, the, the... from height, weight, speed, and all that stuff to, you know, super productive player to going to the University of Pitt. I mean, he's a Pitt Panther, too. So, obviously, the connections and the comparisons to Aaron Donald are always going to be there for Cansey. Did he measure up to those uh, to those comparisons at the Combine Thursday? Today he did. I mean, I feel so bad for the kid in a way because the comparison is so obvious. He's an undersized, upfield, penetrating tackle that is in the Aaron Donald mold and same school, all that stuff. The, the comparisons are going to come like crazy. And I joke all the time, you know, who's your mind? You have Lawrence Taylor, Jim Brown. That's just unfair to any prospect, no matter who he is. Similar style of play though. And you never see this like in the pit press uh, press guide, he was listed at six foot and he came in at six one, you know, like I'm like, Oh no, he's at six foot. That means he's going to be five eleven and an eighth. No, he was taller than they actually listed him, and that was a concern with him. He is a smaller upfield Geno Atkins type of guy, but officially runs a, a four six seven forty, which is was a record for anyone two hundred and eighty pounds or more. And I say that because this dude Ado, I'm just going to say his name real fast so I can, doesn't sound bad when I say it. Adetomo Adawabore from Northwestern. So is as a, is sitting right now at an unofficial 447 at 281 pounds. So there's a chance that Cansey's record or milestone got broken 10 minutes later. We'll see what the official is on the edge guys, but Cansey lit it up. So he definitely made himself some money today. Best 40 amongst defensive tackles by far. A rare 10 yard split as well. One six four on anything under one seven for a D tackle is absolutely phenomenal. Um, he didn't do any of the jumps, but I'm sure he'd have been fine on those as well. So this is a guy, Mel Kuyper, and some of the dudes in the know were surprising with people with by putting him in the first round. I gotta think he's made money today, and is I want I'm pretty safe to say is assuredly a first round pick. Yeah, especially those late first round picks when you right. know, maybe maybe you're, all your first round quote unquote first round grades are off the board, and mm-hmm. you know you can plug in a guy's ready to play now, and you already have a good team, and um, and, and I think Aaron Donald, the the one the one thing that that can't see benefits from with Aaron Donald is people have seen that it works body size work and yeah. because people were scared like some teams uh, there's some people that gave Aaron Donald third round grades because like this is he's too small sorry small. he's amazing but he's too small. And it turns out it didn't didn't matter that much. He can still be disruptive. The, here's the one big thing with with Cansey. So he hit the six one even, which is important. Two hundred eighty one yeah. pounds, still very small, right? Um, but if you're thinking, okay, maybe we'll, he can line up a defensive end. That's where it gets a little dicey. Only thirty and five eighths inch arm length. That's very right. very pedestrian. That's even small for a six one guy, Good arm point. length wise. And so. I don't really going against offensive tackles. Yeah, so probably still only an interior guy. And then at 280 pounds, can he hold up? So there is still some big questions with Cansey, but the athletic athleticism stuff, the you know, the production is all there yep. for Cansey. He's only he there was only eight before him. He's only the ninth player now uh at six one or taller, a defensive lineman to have shorter than 31 inch arms at the NFL scouting combo. Wow, I didn't hear that, but that's that's as alarming as the good stuff, almost, to be honest right. with you. Um, the Donald comparisons are unfair. I look at him more like Ed Oliver. You know, he was like, what, the ninth pick in the draft? And maybe Buffalo doesn't love having spent the ninth pick in the draft on Ed Oliver, but he's a good player. He's a different style of defensive tackle. And you mentioned the end of the first round. If you're a quality team that doesn't have a ton of needs, you think you're playing with the lead a lot, you're a playoff team, this guy's ideal to close teams out, you know, put him next to Chris Jones in Kansas City, you know, things like that. I mean, he's not for everybody. So, by the way, I did see the official measurements for Jalen Carter, and it was 6'3", 314 pounds. 
Good. And arm length, 33 and a half, which is very good. Mm-hmm. And uh, huge 10 inch, 10 and a quarter inch hands. Wow. I mean, he's the prototype. That helps the windmill dunking too, if you can. Yeah, that's a good can, point. Palm of basketball, that helps so much. I, I, I wait, or I, I measure in at 6027, 62 and 7 eighths. Okay. Best I could ever do was dunk a tennis ball, but being able to palm it was about, you know, it was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's huge. There, there's no doubt that that helps so much being able to palm the basketball as far as dunking. <laughs> all the best dunkers could palm the ball. So let's get to a couple edge guys tomorrow, yeah. but I just want to touch on like two or three defensive tackles of note. And- I, I want to mention the because you already brought him up too. And yeah. obviously a combine winner so far is Audubon Oh, yeah. At 280 pounds, he he because he's running with the defensive ends. Whereas right. Kansi's not running much different than tackles, and they're both kind of similar size, you know, sort of squatty and 280 pounds. Um, Audible Ware, though, I, before he before he ran, so he's like standing there with everybody else in their, you know, in their t shirts and their gear, and he was gonna about to step up to the line. And you know, being an A, I think he was he might have been the first runner, he was, he was, yeah, I was watching. And, I was like, what's something's weird with this guy? Is does he have a neck roll on under his t shirt? <laughs> I thought the same thing. Popping out crazy on his neck. It was like this guy yeah. is so built. He's a really odd build. He looks like a, a supersized running back almost, just because yeah. he's so thick all the way up. That uh, I think it was 6'3, 280 pounds. And um it's just muscles on top of muscles and craziness. Yeah. And then the way he got out of the box. And Daniel Jeremiah is like, oh, that was a good 10-yard split. And it was like 4-5 for 280s. Are you serious? And now he's got the unofficial 4-4-9 four, four, with his yeah. second run. I mean, that is unbelievable. So huge winner. And he, he was already going to be a day two guy probably. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it was official. But, I mean, he's going to steal Kansas Thunder, it looks like, five minutes after the poor guy just you know, did a, a milestone run. And Obabore, again, I killed his name. He he has a lot more experience lining up on the edge, so he could be that Michael Bennett power end, you know, type of guy. Where I'm not sure Cansey can. Yeah, and you know, start outside, big end that moves inside and is able to do some of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and very, he's a good player. Around. and he's a good player, and yeah, he's got good tape and uh, production. So yeah, big winner. Uh, his first name really gets me, but no. Ada Bawore is is the last name. I think I've got that one down. Six so, two two eighty two was the official way in. I believe. Just a also couple of names. Chance. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. I mean, uh, all the way around. So, uh, not only does he have a neck roll underneath his t-shirt, six two two hundred eighty two pounds. He's got long arms, almost thirty four inch yes. arms. So thirty three and seven eighths, which is why he's able to perform on the edge with that body type and even bigger hands than Jalen Carter. Ten and a half, ten and a half inch hands are monstrous, guys. So that's he is uh, a rare specimen. Yeah, yeah. You don't winner. see many people look like him. No, a combine even. So two other guys are just just to end the show. Brian Brise is oftenly linked as the second defensive tackle off the board. Clemson did very very well, four eight six, and he had the second best ten yard split, which I did not see coming. So good for him. He's an easy guy to root for. He's really gone through a lot the last couple of years. Um, Zach Pickens from South Carolina had a good one, and Gervin Dexter from Florida is really intriguing to me. This guy is. Six six, crazy long arms, all kinds of potential. Runs a four eight eight in his size. So Gervin Dexter from Florida, I think, is in the round two mix now. I've got a couple of more winners here from the defensive end group. Oh, there's a lot those, of those. those numbers aren't quite final yet, but Lucas Van S. And he's been a guy that's been a riser, even though he quote he didn't like quote unquote start apparently at Iowa, and it's sort of a you know the, the seniors get to start, but he you know, that's he, the whole he was, thing. It's not that he's the best like lineman, right. but it was like he wasn't quote starting, but uh, he's a sort of a power end. He he's really you know bull rush is kind of like his move. So there's some raw ability there, and so teams aren't quite sure what they're going to do with him. I think, and so I think people are kind of all over the place with him. But oh my goodness, he's 6'5, 272 pounds. He ran an unofficial so far. We'll, we'll, we'll talk tomorrow more about some of these official times. Uh, 458 official or unofficial 40 time as a defensive end, 34 inch arms and 11 inch hands. So just everything across the board, just killing it is Lucas Van Ness at the combine. So even if he's anywhere in the 458 neighborhood, when you watch his tape, he wins with power. He just runs through people. So he that's just untapped potential with that speed. Yeah, and, uh, and it's looking like these official times are actually getting faster in some cases. It's, that was the case with Cansey. Yeah, you know, yeah. those, that's, so 
the combine to me because yeah, yeah. they showed at the original time for Cansey was four seven eight. It was a, it was a whole tenth right. lower, and then and so he just bested Aaron Donald, which was four six eight, and Cansey's official came in at four six seven, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you're right. And so they did a, they did the thing where they always do, and they did a side by side of Cansey and Aaron Donald running, and Aaron Donald beat him to the line. So his his unofficial a worse four, seven eight looked like it was more correct than the new time because Donald Donald was clearly faster in the 40, but now he's can't, he's got the faster 40 time. So uh, I'm still curious about how those official times work. Yeah. I, I can't answer that, but it's bizarro. But anyway, um, let's wrap this up. But little teaser, Nolan Smith, the edge from Georgia has put on an absolute show here. We'll break, we'll touch on him maybe tomorrow. He's an undersized guy, but boy, he's a good player and he is lighting it up with every department. Byron Young from Tennessee, uh, Another good one. Yeah. smaller sort of stand up style, outside linebacker, mm-hmm. edge rusher, 6'2, 250, ran a 4'4'3 four, four, as well. So uh, there's some speed out there happening with these defensive ends. Yep. And I'm looking at the vertical right now. So I, I think those are official. Smith, Young, who you mentioned, and Abaware were the best three so far on, on the day. I mean, that's pretty impressive stuff. Another one for Abaware. Uh, He's out of a war. That's your question. We're going to have to get, learn his names. I have a feeling it might be. <laughs> I might have to learn his name. Some of, because these, of, the some round, of these workout numbers. All right. Fantastic stuff. And more, of course, throughout the, the week and the weekend and into next week with the NFL scouting combine. Of course, Matt and I will be here with you every day with all of it on the Locked On Podcast Network, Peacock and Williamson.